Okay, so we are talking today. Everybody with us here? Yeah, sorry. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll get some more folks. Deep energy uh, retrofits and net zero buildings and energy efficient construction. Um, and I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Hitchcock Center building. I was involved in that one just in finding a site. It took about five years to find the right site. And luckily we, we came up with the after college thing. Uh, and thank, thank goodness the right builder did a fantastic job. So um, I'll let um, uh, Seth, Lawrence Slavis, and Roger Cooney uh, um, introduce themselves because their uh, info is on the PowerPoint that they have. And then I'll read Nate Connor's bio. Nate is an account manager for ICEF, representing the Mass Safe Residential New Construction Program's many program offerings. He's worked in the energy efficiency field since 2008, after graduating with a BS degree in environmental science from UMass Boston. He has worked on both the East and West Coast in commercial and residential energy efficiency programs. In addition to starting a coral reef construction and conservation organization in the Dominican Republic. Cool. Did you bring that PowerPoint? <laughs> no, it's just an excuse to go scuba diving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think, is Roger starting? Or? Uh, Seth is going to start. I'm going to start. Okay. Oh, there I am. Yeah, the down arrow when you need to. Okay. He had more hair then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm Chen. <laughs> that would be I say, are we talking about Roger here? <laughs> you should see his picture. Uh, <laughs> you will. Yeah. Thanks. I'm president and co-owner of Right Builders. Um, I went to GCC for an associate's degree in their sustainability program, and that was still available there. It's since released a little bit. Um, I got a bachelor's degree from UMass Amherst in the building construction and technology department and I went on for a master's degree degree there in uh, sustainable systems and mass timber studies using eastern white pine and hemlock um, trying to develop a, a forest initiative and a structural panel for that type of construction that uh, would be something in local for the local forestry here. Um, I'm a lead AP. I like doing lots of things outside. Um, I have two children that I love dearly, daily. <laughs> remind yourself. I remind myself. And you know, part of this presentation is about DERs and I'm gonna relate it a little bit to my experience as a father with my daughter especially, um, that you sort of assess the situation and then you do some tests on the situation, and then you develop a really solid plan that can't be brought back in the future. Um, <laughs> she's 13. She's 13. Oh, no, no, no. I should put that in. She's 13. Put in that context. <laughs> and you're still wrong. <laughs> and the DER is still going to tear down. <laughs> um, so, couple learning objectives of, of what we're going to do today. Um, we're, we're doing a 10,000 foot uh, you know, uh, talk here about not going to get into the details, the minutiae minutia of everything, but I want people to understand what a DR is, who, what, who as a, as a consumer and what projects are, are viable and, and good candidates. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about operational energy use well, operational and embodied energy. You, you, um, spelled, you spelled that out, but I assume you mean DER, deep energy retrofit. Deep energy retrofit. Oh, right. yep. like we're talking in code, let us know. Right, yeah. Well, you'll see on the next, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll format here. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about lower carbon building materials, um, replacing some of the high intensity carbon materials with alternatives that uh, can move us to a future of zero carbon or low carbon, I don't want to over, over promise here. Um, so there it is, DER, Deep Energy Retrofit. It's, um, it's analysis, really it's an analysis of the building that starts an existing building. So you, you would look at it, you would measure different sections of that building and look at the energy cost, look at 
look at air leakage, um, anything that will make the performance of that building, the health of the occupants in that building, more positive than what it started out at. And we're, we're trying to hit a guideline here that says, you know, we want to we want to increase this building's efficiency by at least 50%. It that's that's the minimum of, of that. Um, we want to lower operational and embodied energy requirements on that building. There's no point in doing the work. We're we're putting embodied energy into something in a in a retrofit. So we need to understand the relationship between that embodied energy that's going in and the operational savings over a time period. And we talked a little bit, some people are here from a residential standpoint, some people are here from a municipal standpoint. There are very different goals in mind for DERs in those two realms. Generally speaking, municipalities, we're interested in what the return value is of the building. How are we enhancing the energy use that's returning a monetary value first, and then a, then a human value after that, environmental and human value as seconds. With, with personal homes, generally we, we tend to lean towards, this is where you're spending most of your time. And so the value we're really looking at, while financial matters, it's about health of the occupancy and safety of the building. Um, it's seen hands down as, a, as an integral part of making sure that this climate crisis is slowed. Um, doing BP DERs is not gonna stop the energy crisis, but our underperforming buildings that are in the, in the world right now are a big percentage of, of this nation. And so if we utilize those un underperforming buildings and try to get them up to the level, rather than just building a new building, we have already saved ourselves a lot of time. Um, and carbon. And carbon. And, and, and everything. So first thing you do is assess the, uh, assess the project. A um, Couple different charts here. There's, there's a conventional evaluation of, of the net present value, what the, what the retrofit would cost, and what your energy cost savings would, would be back. If those go positive, if your energy costs go positive, Sounds like a foregone conclusion, we're gonna do this retrofit. It's not quite that simple. Um, you really wanna look at a whole host of other risks that are gonna be involved in the retrofit. So you're looking at, if this, is a, if this is a commercial building, you're looking at any tenant revenues that would increase due to an operational decrease in, a, in energy use. So maybe there's a tanning salon here and by doing, doing envelope work and doing solar and going electrified, that reduces the cost to that salon. What does that in turn give the tenant back as an as a, um, increased uh, revenue? Um, operational cost savings, that's pretty simple, to, tangible to grasp, right? That's municipalities, that's a huge one. If you can lower the operational cost of a building, it's just more money to put in other things. You're not worried about that. Um, most of the, our assessments right off the bat start with a simple box model. A simple box model is an energy model. Um, it looks at what the building's envelope is, um, different factors, air leakage, insulation value, um, south facing windows, what your solar gain is. All of these things come into play but it's not, it doesn't go to the minutia of the building. And so we do a simple box model and we look at the areas that are most cost effective to do a retrofit in. Um, sometimes the building has decent windows and the air leakage isn't bad around the windows. And by going from a double pane window to a triple pane, the cost payback may, might be 10 years. For a municipality that doesn't make sense as a 10 year payback. You know, usually you're gonna be looking at a five to seven year payback. Um, there's, there's comfort situations in that, as we were talking about. Um, just more additional value beyond the energy cost savings is really the point of the risk assessment and the assessment in the DER right off the bat. You don't want to start doing work without doing the work before the hammer hits the nail. You'll do a lot of extra stuff that 
isn't necessarily a good payback. Um, there's a couple different ways that we stage DERs. This is more commercial and municipality that you're looking at, at stages on year basis. So, you know, this is an example. Um, don't take this as, you know, the end all. But stage one would be things that are, uh, you know, let's say we have single pane windows here. We gotta address the windows, that's the exterior of the envelope. Um, lighting is a big one, a lot of old buildings we're still, we're still either in, we're probably not quite <laughs> incandescent anymore, <laughs> um, but, but, certainly but, but certainly fluorescent, CFL, um, you know, most of these, well these look like, yeah, some, of these, I think some of these are fluorescent, some of these are LED tubes. Um, but those are, those are some of the simplest things to do and, and least, uh, least invasive to the building, right? So Mass Save has, has things with that, that that we can talk about later. Um, as you go through stage two, stage three, you start looking at really much bigger platforms that we're gonna, we're gonna be looking at. Entire roofs, in terms of uh, insulating above the envelope scenarios, wall systems. Um, stage three would be a 30 year look at all the heating systems, maybe some renewable energy. Maybe we're going from uh, an uh, oil or, or gas boiler and we're thinking about going with mini splits or um, heat pump technology, which is great, but it's great when it's coupled with something on site, right? So. We want to look at all of these renewable energies that can add to the electrification of, of the house. Um, or what does the year column mean in that? That its value would last for 15 cor years? Correct. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if it was yeah. like 15 years later you'd do stage two. No, 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 no. Okay. It, it, it's, yeah, it's a value part, right? So, so okay. look at this as uh, the, not only carbon payback, but monetary paybacks that you're yeah. looking at. Thank right. you. Yep. So, uh, because you're not you're not doing the uh, windows and air tightness every year. Correct. But you, it's it's a one year payback. You're saying the roof could be more than a, a, a could be a 15 year payback. A roof and ventilation system and. It's more what that what that's lasting for, right? So we're looking we're looking at. Um, do do uh, 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 heat pumps last 30 years? Heat pumps are in that 15 to 20 year range. Yeah. Um, he, the renewable energy systems are going to be at that 30 year range. So the solar panels, 25, um, any, any uh, ground source are going to be 30 in that range. Yeah. So one of the things we always think about when we're, when we're doing it is how the specifications of the project are going to generate the DER in the end of the day. Um, most DERs focus on operational energy, but we're talking about embodied carbon now a lot more. And as operational energy gets more effective and efficient, then uh, the embodied energy that's in building materials becomes that much more significant. So we always want to specify when we're doing this work, low carbon building materials. Um, we don't want to specify exotic items. They're getting shipped here. We have no control over how those items are being manufactured and produced. Um, and there's really no reporting knowledge of that stuff. So we're trying to look at local or regional items for that. Um, wood framing is a really easy part of specification. It's generally not looked at in commercial sense. You, you get a lot of steel framing in the commercial buildings. If we specify wood framing, we can carbon sequester and lower that embodied content of that DER. Um, we try to get as much foams out of buildings as we can at this point. There's no need to use spray foam everywhere. Spray foam has a lot of great applications. It doesn't need to be everywhere. We can use blown in cellulose and walls, connection points for floors and, and ceilings. It's a really good um, thing to have spray foam. Those are areas that air sealing can become really hard at um, but we want to get as much of that stuff out and what we're seeing a lot more and Roger will attest to this later is that the DER is looked at as we're going to skin an envelope and we're just going to put a bunch of foam on the outside of the building and 
while that does amazing things for operational energy, the, the um, high carbon content of those materials offsets that operational energy gain. And that's not helpful, again. Um, healthy materials. But then, it, but then it offsets uh, what the energy you're using for. But you're saying if you do, can do it some other way, but it's still insulating the outside of the structure, it keeps the uh, structure warmer, you know? It, yeah, I'm not talking not, about not insulating the outside of the structure. I'm gonna make that really clear. I'm talking about what we're using as materials for that insulation, right? So. Mineral wool, is that much better than foam? No. There are, there is a lot of wood products out there now, or that are coming out, and they're gonna be online within the next year for Maine, where it's a wood fiber insulation board. It's been a European standard for a long time. Um, we can get it here. We don't love specifying it yet because it comes over the puddle. So everything that's coming from Germany, it's coming over here. And it, again, we have to look at that embodied content. And of you still that need movement. to keep that from getting wet. So it's, a, it's considered a WRB, which is a weather resistant barrier. So it is considered that, but yes, you always want to look at it at a wall system as you, you want to keep it dry. It might get wet at some point. We need the rain out. Right. Um, healthy materials, obviously, as we're tightening up these houses, that specification becomes really important. Carpets that we see everywhere, um, you have to be really careful about them. They have a lot of off-gassing potential. Um, VOCs, I think everybody has heard about VOCs, volatile organic compounds at this point. There's, there's little known um, more about flame retardants and other polyurethane finishes. POFAs. PFAS, right? Yeah. yeah. Which is the tip of the iceberg. Folks. Which is the tip right. of the iceberg. And, and I'm not going to, again, we could go down a deep rabbit hole here on, on materials. Yeah, um, if we could, because the, the detailed questions, I'm afraid we won't get through yeah. the whole thing. So yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, and, and specifying efficient appliances. This, this is really kind of common sense stuff with DDR. We don't want to specify another coal or, <laughs> or oil bur burning uh, appliance in this house. It, we want to go with electric. We're trying to electrify. We want smart meters. We want smart devices. Those things manage those incredibly efficient electronic devices in a way that allows them to capture more efficiency. Um, so operational embodied carbon, talked a lot about this already. Operational is the energy used while the building is in use by occupants and users after construction, not during construction. Um, it's accumulated over time, so it never stops. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, and it can be influenced. That's the beauty of it. It can be lowered or it could be brought up. Um, we would love to see it lowered. A lot of that's occupant behavior. So as municipalities look at this, having a plan set for occupant behavior within that municipality, within that school set points, those can really matter with operational energy use. Um, embodied energy or carbon is the, the energy that's used in the manufacturing materials, systems, transportation to the site, the digging of the of the stone, the, the quarry, all of it, cradle to grave. That's that's uh, that's embodied energy. It's content that's incurred generally one time with a material. Although steel has double embodied energy involved in it because of the recycling process, um, and you incur it once, other than when you do a renovation or you know it's in that building process. So just a little global CO2 emissions. I'm sure everybody has seen these charts, but building materials and construction makes up 11% of our global CO2 emissions and operations makes up the other 28%. So here we have operational and embodied energy making up almost you know, 45, 40%, 42% if you take transportation and some of the industry into it, quite a bit quite a lot of ability there to change it. Um, the relationship between operational and body carbon matters a lot. So this graph shows 
at, at the first year of a building, think of 2010 and these years below, think of those as, as a building was built in 2010, 100% of that, the embodied energy is there in that building. As time gets longer, that percentage of embodied energy drops in that building because we're storing it over that period of time. So that embodied energy curve, relax. It's not a huge consumption because we're spanning it over time. Operational energy is the inverse of that. So as the building starts operating, we start seeing that curve happens. You can see here, about at 18 years, in a code built, code minimum building, we get that cross point where all of a sudden the operational energy becomes the more important line and that's where our growth is. As we lower operational energy through efficiency, this line drops down. This time period moves out. And so what's really important at that point is to drop this line and start moving this down so that everything can compress and um, you know, the, the building products and materials will have a bigger impact in the building when we really are in an efficient situation with new construction especially. So making case, electrification really has everything to do with DERs, with operational and embodied energy. Um, unfortunately, electricity is not easy to store. It's easy, it transports, we have losses in electricity from generation and transport, but it's hard to store. It's, uh, we can have it in battery banks, those have its own economic and environmental value. Um, what, we, what we would love to do is, is get that energy, especially at peak times, to where we're leveraging it against a one-to-one -one ratio. So heat pumps, COP, um, three plus, that means three kilowatts go in, or one kilowatt goes in, three kilowatts of, of energy come out of that thing. Um, smart boilers are another really good way of storing heat energy through electricity. Those boilers are, are things that can, that can hold, they'll heat, up they'll heat up water and it will, it will hold it really well for six plus hours at that, at that heated state. So it's not a huge impact of electricity constantly through the, through the realm there. Power to gas, some grid power, we're gonna look at the excess power that's, that's being produced is gonna go and we can make hydrogen gas with it and we can store that stuff. When we're able to store it, it leverages us completely against um, the natural gas and, and, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Northfield Mountain does a really good job of this, by the way, right? Yeah, they sold it to Canadian Power. <laughs> So Canadian Power does a really yeah. good job. <laughs> they have solar there, and that's not what I'm talking about. That's a pump storage facility, and at peak times they're running that pump. So they're looking at that at that old, or at low times rather, they're running that pump. So when they have the overage of power, they're running that pump and they're storing it in the form of water on top of that mountain. Then they drop it during peak times when they need that energy and that consumption is there. And so it's a very it's a really not wasteful way of the best peak of plants we could have. Agreed. Um, last thing, lower, lower carbon materials. How many commercial buildings do we see with aluminum rain screens on them? They're beautiful. All these new buildings that we see, they all have aluminum on them. Aluminum has the highest global warming potential of any metal that we produce. And it's, and it's a low producing metal we don't produce a lot of it, and it has the percentage that's the highest out of all of them for global warming. So we can make decisions based off of this information about what kind of materials we're putting into a building and how that's affecting embodied energy and the, and the embodied carbon as a result. That's higher than stainless? Higher than stainless. Higher than any steel. No. Higher than iron. Higher than ore. You, I have mean, to, you have to mine it in the tropics and take it. I'm through. sorry, can we just let them get through the presentation? Thank you. Um, we want to limit concrete as well. Concrete is also a high potential. Um, PVC, foams, those are all high carbon potential. Um, and then really simple stuff, using local materials, finding stuff within 20 miles of us. 
um, using local woods. Those things all will help lower the embodied content. Raj, you're up. So you ready for the fire hose? <laughs> um, I just want to preface it by saying uh, thanks for having us here. Um, we appreciate that. Um, there are handouts out here that have a little, if you want to do deep dive on Andy's buildings that we're going to talk about the, today. Um, Hitchcock Center, um, uh, W.R. Kern Center, um, and River Valley Co-op. There's, there's information that is gleaned here. There's also at the very end of this presentation, because you're going to have access to this later, there's all kinds of links to websites where you can get at a lot of this detail that you're going to really want. So um, my background, uh, I've been with Wright Builders for uh, going on 18 years. Um, prior to that, I owned my own design business. Prior to that, um, I was uh, uh, in a rock and roll band. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was an audio engineer, which took me from East Podunk to Carnegie Hall, literally. Um, and I worked with all kinds of, uh, I don't think that's listed on here. <laughs> um, I got, you know, I have this pedigree, I have degrees, yada, yada, yada. Uh, my schooling really came after school. Um, and uh, um, so we really can't talk about anything, I think, in my view, without talking about living buildings and what is that? What are they? Um, so if you're familiar with LEED, the LEED standard, with Passive House standard, with Energy Star, um, with, uh, you know, there's some European standards, there's the other side of the planet, you know, uh, Japanese have standards, so on. Um, uh, the Living Building Institute, the International Living Future Institute, ILFI, doesn't really roll off the tongue. Actually came out of Pacific Northwest, it was, it was a lead, there were people that were involved in the lead world, so we're not going far enough. We're just checking the box. There was no sort of checking of you know, what you modeled, did it, did it really work? Um, what was the actual performance of these hypothetical buildings that got built and so on? Both of these buildings that Wright Builders built almost uh, you know, simultaneously met the full living building standard of that time, and that's more, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So kind of the context of this, this gathering, um, how are we going to save our respective uh, selves and this planet? Pretty big goal. That's really kind of overwhelming. There's a roadmap here now, folks. How, you know, you can make it large or small, and you don't have to do the full program, but there's, you can stratify the different things that you can take, whether it's for your home or for a municipality or anything in between. There's a body of knowledge now that's available, the advent of the internet and, and you know, modern day library, anybody anywhere on the planet can get at this information, it's open source, there's a lot of people working on this problem. And uh, so, but locally, we've got some shining examples of how to, how to do this stuff and a lot of know-how. Um, I know you said you were involved in land acquisition for Hitchcock and so there's probably more people, well, you, you know more than you think you know. Our goal here today is just kind of like touch on some of these high points and leave some time at the end so we can do a little Q&A. And we're available for follow up if anybody has you know burning questions. So. Um, it's an ever-evolving program. Um, it is not a check-the-box. Uh, it is a standard that says that it's going to be to your locale and what is it you're trying to achieve. And that they talk about, uh, you know, it being dynamic where it's not, it changes every time we build one of these things. There's all that knowledge that's acquired that then can be folded into this massive database. The assumption is when you enter into trying to do something like this, you've got some really sound fundamentals in terms of your your knowledge, or you, you know, in terms of building science and all that comes with that and, and development of sites and just the whole breadth of it, you want to gather a team to, to do that work and to work with you collaboratively. So you can draw from those expertises and there's a lot of them here and, and throughout the country and, and on the planet for that matter. So just know that this challenge is really a challenge. There are, it, I'm saying it's not check the box, but there's certain prerequisites <laughs> you have to do in lead. There's imperatives you have to do with this program as well. There's certain baselines. There's no opt out. There's no like you can fudge the system. There's no I'll put a you know a bike rack in instead of doing something else you can't game it. You have to hit these imperatives, and they go deep and they go wide, and it's based on a flower. So it's logical. It's science based. There's a world of information. The standard is ever evolving. It's based on petals around a flower. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, it is. It goes beyond best practices. It, it's probably leading edge, it could be bleeding edge. These two buildings really built and designed and built the first sort of sanitary systems that we'll touch on kind of briefly. So um, 
It also has to be uh, tested for a year before it is checked the box. And if, if, that, if that, those marks are not hit, you have to reset, you have to start again. So it's not like you could just go, yeah, we got the model set and now we're good to go. Uh, LEAD, LEAD has kind of moved to that. The federal government has a standard for all the, you know, all the federal buildings that they build that have to hit a LEAD standard. And it used to be that you could just get a pass and yeah, we're, you can't do that any longer. So these systems are morphing. They're driving code, um, energy code. And so that, you know, the good news is that, you know, legislation, litigation, legislation will come along that will require as a baseline, these are standards we have to build to. Passive house will probably become a standard for Massachusetts, which is kind of unique. And there's the international building code, but then we have our own code. And chances are, I mean, you know, there's kind of prescriptive path and there's mandatory path. And that may be something that will fold in. The question is, they're starting to talk about living building in Massachusetts code, which is pretty cool. Right, so this is kind of where we hang out. Code minimum, we 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 call code minimum one notch above illegal. <laughs> I stole that, by the way. R and D, that would be research and duplicate. Or is that rip off and duplicate? Rip off. Yeah. So um, so everything I know I learned on, yeah. Uh, then there's the greening. The green washing is out there. The green. What does that mean? It's so widely interpreted, but right. So that we kind of hang out where we've been hanging out for decades. Now we get into high performance. That's kind of our wheelhouse, but how do we push beyond? We got very good at doing really good envelopes, right? Meaning envelope being the building, the floor, the wall, the roof, right? Windows, we've gotten very good at that. Seth touched on, you know, the, the, the cradle to gate, didn't say, and gate to right, the tomb. It's like, now we're working on the front end from raw extraction, where's it coming from, how we get in here, we're putting it into this building, right? Um, that's really where we're at right now. We've got very good at high performance. We can put a mini split in it with this ground source or this and that, electrification. We've got that, we've got that now. We should put our money in a really good building envelope because the technology will change. And so that building science is pretty well there. Now we're working on the front end. How can we get better at body? And it's almost ironic or coincidental that fiber-based materials that we used to build everything out of, right, is now what we should be building everything out yeah. of. <laughs> I don't know. So, then how do we get to the living building side of it? And so, it's based on pedals. And this gets to a little bit of your, your red list compliant that was a little graphic that was up there earlier. Um, that is a universe in and of itself. But this is the stuff that will keep you awake at night. So I'll, I don't want to go doom and gloom, but chemicals that go into building products, the list is exponential. And it's all very difficult to figure out. And with a living building, you could not have any red listed products in those buildings. That information is known. It's available, it's widely available. Major institutions are adopting, getting that stuff out. Carpet has gotten much better, but you know, what is what is in that Formica? What where was that metal manufactured and what what's that paint that's on there? If you think about that assembly of lighting, what's in there, all that stuff and sort of in the in the Materials pedal, you have to, you have to. Uh, we showed a graphic before we started building the current center. It had a pickup truck with nothing in it. <laughs> you can't put anything in that pickup truck and bring it out to that site until you know what its material content is. So some thousands of submittals later, there's a company we can turn you on to that has building a whole um, interface for re you know getting out this information. They, they make that available for a fee. Uh, there's also Declare, which you'll see a graphic here later, certain manufacturers. The goal here is to drive the, to drive the market to have manufacturing change the way they're producing a disclosure. And they have proprietary stuff and it's difficult, but if we all work individually and collectively towards driving the marketplace to have building materials you know, be healthy for human beings, living things, then guess what? The marketplace will change over time, right? We have buying power. So um, in no particular order, you know, we talk about energy and it's a ground source heat pump or it's whatever it is that's producing that electrification. Um, generally speaking, I'll just leave it at that. But these buildings have to be net positive energy. They have to produce more energy than they utilize, and they do. Um, they have to uh, have net water. Actually, they have to produce more water on site than they use, right? So there's catchments that gather all the water and it's processed on site. So for potable, potable, 
portable pot, oh, potato pot, drinkable. <laughs> drinkable water, thank you, right? And uh, composting toilets and this and that, right? And then those closed systems, those closed systems, so everything's on site. And you'll see some graphics on that. Um, <clears throat> then there's uh, health and happiness. And there's beauty. Um, and there's place. And there's equity. And these all have depth of things that have to happen in the paradise, you'll see in another graphic. So um, here they are. <clears throat> Your place is important. What is that site? Is it redeveloped? Is it is it raw? Is it, you know, if nothing's been there, you're felling a whole forest to build a building? Probably ought to not do that, look for another site. With the case of Hitchcock, it was a dirty site in the sense that it had been an apple orchard. And we went to great lengths to exhume and then re-entomb the arsenic that was in the soil, right? So took a dirty site, cleaned it up, right? Place matters. Um, and these are imperatives, so this whole metric that drives that. But it's not just new buildings, it could be existing buildings to so DERs and retrofits and those kinds of things. It could be uh, interior retrofits, you know, you got a massive campus, you got a college, you got a high school, you know, you're doing a retrofit, so what, so this is, they talk about topology, they talk about scalable, they talk about uh, zone jumping, all kind of buzzwords, but basically saying there are different pathways to get to where you want to get to, um, and if it's just landscaping, what does that look like? But within the context of place is, you know, what's the ecology? Um, I think this graphic indicates that these are scale jumpings allowed, so you can go to something else, um, and then there's imperatives where you, you must hit certain imperatives. You must hit all of them, or you can't, you can't uh, get certified. Um, you might say, I don't want to do a whole, a whole project that's fully certified, but there's other things you can do. Maybe it's just material-based. I think uh, Harvard and Yale have done like major retrofits of buildings. They drove the marketplace in terms of buying power, in terms of the carpet that's going in those buildings, which is healthy. Um, hits, the, has, hits the red list, compliant. So uh, water, we talked about a little bit. It's got to be positive. Reuse everything that's there. Um, energy, uh, we, you know, where that reduces the carbon, it has to be produced more than it uses. Health and happiness is not esoteric. This is not highfalutin. Hypo, hypo, this isn't like, this is like, how are those healthy interiors? What are those? And COVID showed us this stuff, like what all these schools that didn't have filtration, how are you, how are you controlling that? It's critically important, right? Um, and the materials, it's all intertwined. Uh, responsibility uh, within that. This is a huge bit. Um, when we started out on this project, actually it was predated by Smith College's Environmental Center, which we had a hand in uh, budgeting and, and figuring out early on with Bruce Coleman and Coleman Hart and Architects. Um, this stuff didn't exist. This paperwork didn't exist. This knowledge of how to do. We, we kind of, with a whole group of people, invented this. And so now you can build on those, you know, building on giants that came before. Um, responsible sourcing knowing where it's coming from that's really linked to equity and social justice, copper mining, gypsum mining, diamond mining, not putting a lot of diamonds in buildings, oh, but there's diamonds and tools to cut stuff. Um, you know, what's going on in those parts of the planet where people are being, uh, you know what I'm saying, I, I see some nodding heads, I don't, want, you know, I don't want to get too far into that other than to say that we have real buying power and we can influence social justice on this planet, right? And so that's an important piece of it. And who's working on the job? And what are they doing? And are they getting paid a living wage? How about more than the living wage? What's their health benefits? What are the environmental things that are going on for them when they're touching these materials and processing them, putting them in the building? And how are we taking care of that, those folks, right? Um, and then beauty, because we all need that. And so what's not described, and here it is, biophilia. What is that? That's a 50 center, right? So. We end up being human beings on this planet for a millennium, right? And we lived outside a lot, right? And then we became cave dwellers and put a fire in the middle of the cave and we had some air quality issues, didn't we? I don't know if we evolved a whole lot from that. <laughs> um, but we were connected to the outside and to, to the light and the seasons and so on. And then we decided we could stay in the cave and then we made the caves better and better and better and now we live inside the cave with the draw and shades and <laughs> ventilation's sort of good in here, and, right? So um, that connection, to, to place and space and nature is critically important for us. And so these buildings are designing with that idea in mind, bringing the outside in and the inside out. You'll see that in some examples as we get along. 
I really wanted to spend some time here because this is, to me, this is, this is one of the big sort of pillars, if you will, of this approach to how do we make buildings better, how do we improve the quality of life, how do we you know, drive, the, drive the cost down. We didn't talk about money. We can touch on that, but how do we make it more healthy environment for us and for our loved ones? And so, um, yeah, I have, by the way, I have, my bio, I have lots of kids. Last count, there's like five of them kicking around, but they're older now. They still tolerate, they like to hang out with me, you know. Um, so, so then we get into shining example. What does this look like? What is it, what, what's tangible? Our takeaways can be, you know, here's some stuff you can go to and you can find out more about. And you already know Hitchcock and you've probably been to Kern Center and maybe you've been to River Valley Co-op's um, new, new building in East Hampton. Um, and so um, these, these two, uh, Hitchcock and, and Kern, are fully certified. Uh, I mean, that, all those pedals, all those imperatives, everything was hit there, right? Um, and uh, they, they do have big PV arrays, photovoltaic arrays. They generate all the electricity. They generate more than they utilize. They both have catchments on the roof, so these roofs are designed to go down to a, to a gutter, uh, a gutter to a downspout that fills huge tanks that are underground here. Same thing. There's a big, there's a big gutter along the edge of this butterfly, and it drives and fills two cisterns that waters that you know brought in the building. And there's some graphics in here that'll show you all of that. Um, coincidentally, there's really no coincidence in our view. These are all wood buildings. There's no structural steel in here, right? And Seth and I are trying to crack this nut because there's structural steel in, in River Valley Co-op. Not quite there in terms of local manufacturing, not quite there yet in terms of spans, but we're working on it. You're working on it, other people are working on it. So um, UMass is building um, the, the John building. Oliver building, the design building mm -hmm. at UMass is a mass timber building. Yeah, there's some structural steel in there too and the code is such and so on. I don't want to get down in the weeds, but the point is if we can do more buildings that are all wood buildings. Um, you have to think about it. This is uh, this is science. This is building science. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So we get in a little bit more into uh, those particulars. It is fully certified. It is it is better than net zero. It is net positive water, net net. So we got zero and you got below zero, you got above zero and below zero. This is kind of like the hers rating, right? It's like, it's kind of esoteric. It's like, so the better it gets, it gets to zero. If it's below zero, you're producing more, you have more water then, right? Um, necessary for us on the planet, right? Let's do less harm. Let's talk about regenerative. There was a great presentation at UMass last week about uh, climate change and sort of what we saw earlier this morning in, in the, in the in the planet area, I'm talking about you know major climate events that are going to affect these big swings. When I worked at UMass um, in radio astronomy 35 years ago, it was, we were doing uh, research on a bunch of stuff, and all these prognostications about major changes on, on climate have, have all come to roost. So we could fix this problem. Anybody who's my age remembers uh, the first oil embargo? You don't know. <laughs> you don't know, right? Um, and you combustion engines at that time, right? Didn't have, uh, they were like a straight block, right? And they weren't very efficient. And then it came up with fuel injection, which effectively doubled the oil, re oil reserve in the continental US. I'm not promoting that we do more, more oil research or petroleum or fossil fuels, but um, we do have ways to fix this, folks. This is not all doom and gloom. We can get there. Right. This, this, I just want to make sure we're leaving enough time for you. I know. I'm, 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 I'm about there. So these are, these are some eye, you know, pictures that just show. Uh, again, all this information is available, right? Goshen stone, right? Native lumber. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, Beautiful. It's a beautiful timber, building right? inside, too. This have, this have to be yarrow windows. This is coming across the puddle. But part of the part of the thing about material acquisition is that you have to work diligently to get it close to where you are. And if you can't, then you're allowed to jump out to another and out to another. So most everything we did in these buildings are, are regional, with the exception of things that you would expect. Like yeah, The woods are black spruce. Um, that's coming down from Montreal. Yeah. Nordic, 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 Nordic land did yeah. those. And that was the closest mass timber producer at that point, and uh, still is, yeah. actually. Yeah, all wood deck in here. So um, 
you know, people live in these spaces. But you walk in this building, it doesn't smell. I mean, it doesn't smell like the new building, right? So you'll get these graphics in the handouts right here if you didn't have them. It talks about all the various systems and what's going on here. Again, this stuff is all done locally. Um, and then a recent acquisition. This is not a living building. I just want to make sure that I put that out there. But what's unique about this structure um, is that I want to carefully represent that we don't know we're net zero here yet, but we think we will be. Um, uh, EUI, energy use index for buildings, for this building is massive. For most supermarkets, it is because of the amount of refrigeration and food preparation that goes on there. And so, to our knowledge, no one's actually turned the meter backwards on a building like this yet, and, uh, and, and we're close. So we've got massive PV. Um, for folks who are municipalities and towns who are trying to make this happen and do a thing where you have a bunch of buildings that are going together with a geothermal and that kind of stuff, it's brilliant. It's, it's, it's like, do that because communities aren't doing that. If we all strength, if we put all our first costs are high, right? But if we, we all band together and create these systems that distribute heat and cooling to all these places, you start modeling that, it makes really, really good sense. There's some information in here about taxes and, and you know, where to get funding for this and so on. Um, and it's important to places be nice and beautiful, right? So again, you've got all kinds of stuff that you can tap in here and if you can get handouts. And, uh, so that's really quick and a lot. And we, we want to leave a little bit to other ways you can get money so you can pay for this. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, my name is Nate. I'm an account manager with the Mass Save Residential New Construction Programs. And those are what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I always like to kind of start everything out by just kind of what Mass Save is. Uh, a lot of people don't understand exactly how it formed. Uh, all the major utilities across the state, along with Cape Cod, uh, sorry, <laughs> Cape Light Compact, um, came together to form this uh, program. Uh, it's designed with one goal, which is just to try and help homeowners and businesses across the state save money and energy, and by doing so, lead to a more clean and efficient future. Um, so, the residential new construction path is a single point of contact that covers uh, projects with multiple fuel types, utilities, and both commercial and residential meters. Uh, incentives are performance based, so the higher efficiency level that you get to, the more of an incentive you, you get. Uh, how the Mass Save program is funded is a portion of the utility bills are paid that you, you me, everybody else pays every month uh, goes to fund this program. Uh, so whatever you get out of it, you've earned it. Uh, uh, the program requirements and performance targets do align with the Mass Base, Massachusetts Base and Stretch Energy Codes. Um, and my company, ICF, is the program administrator's uh, lead vendor for the program, so we run the whole program. Okay, I'm going to talk about the top three here. Uh, the lower three, high rise, I'm not sure if they're building any 10 story building or sorry, 25 story apartment buildings yeah. around here or anything like that. So uh, if you are interested in any of the bottom three, you can feel free to contact me and I'll uh, gladly answer any questions. Uh, but the low rise new construction path, the renovations and additions path, and the all new, shiny new, uh, one to four unit, all electric home incentive are the main ones that I cover personally. And uh, so we'll start out with, uh, I'm going to use RNA rather than renovations and additions, it's a little easier to say, uh, but we're going to start with the RNA and low rise paths. Um, single families, new construction or existing they cover, multi-families so, uh, multi up to three stories, uh, existing and new construction will cover as long as the, um, the multi-families are individually metered. I can't have a master meter running the whole building. Um, but yeah, large renovations, additions, uh, we, we, strictly, we strictly adhere to residential energy codes. Um, you can't put, I don't know why my, I missed that, I should have taken that out, it was my boss's old slide. Res, yeah, you can't put commercial equipment in a, in a uh, residential house, sorry guys. <laughs> um, but uh, how the program works is you use one of, uh, one of our uh, program approved HERS raters, and they will take you through the program and through whichever path you choose here. Um, with the RNA and low rise programs, there is no commercially, uh, commercial meters for buildings or units, apartment buildings that's allowed through these two programs. So we're we'll aware of there too as well. Um, so the other one is uh, just, uh, this is, like I said, this is brand new this year. This is a really exciting one. Finally got it off the ground. It's a one to four unit new construction. Um, 
where the incentives now can go up to $40,000 for a four family building, which is big. Uh, that's also, if you have one four family building here and you build another one right next to it, yes, yeah, so you can get 80,000. It's not just for one project property. It's you know, as long as they're all individually metered and they're next to each other and the buildings are separate, you're good to go on that. So um, these pathways obviously have enhanced performance requirements. Uh, we're not just gonna give you that for throwing you know, standard insulation or standard heating systems. They do have extra requirements. They're not hard to achieve. I just want to say yes, that. yes. We're and doing it. We're yeah. Doing it. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it shows, I'll, I'll give you a list here in a second too of uh, let's get the general ones. But uh, we, with, with this program as well, uh, it's all HERS Raider based. So you just hire one of the program approved HERS Raiders, and they'll carry you right through here um, and get you whatever the rebate is for this. Um, so now we're gonna really get into this. Now again, with the uh, three stories or less for uh, multifamilies, just remember that each multifamily needs to be individually metered. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've come across that with a builder and it's just, oh gosh. So, um, so again, this is new ground up new construction homes in the low rise program. Uh, general participants are builders, developers, and homeowners. Uh, there are other areas, but uh, those are the main ones. Um, again, Program approved HERS rating companies. So we're gonna be using that word a lot in this. And again, they're gonna take you right through. It's pretty simple. You're just gonna hire them. Uh, they will take uh, all the, the little analysis of the building plans and anything else you can provide them and give you an energy savings assessment uh, at, uh, right at the beginning. Um, that should also give an estimate on what you say. The savings turns, for, <laughs> turns into uh, the rebates through these programs. So by seeing that, you'll see the rebate estimate at the end as well. Uh, with the low rise program, it's two inspections. There'll be one inspection at the midpoint of the, of the project and one inspection at the end. Uh, after the final inspection is done, uh, the savings will be tabulated by the HERS rater and he, will, he or she will uh, process the incentive for you. And uh, then you'll get whatever. So you you're, you're saying uh, every, the two family have to be metered separately. What if there's a, a common, uh, a common area, That's common fine. lights, that, so you need another, you, need, you actually need three? Yeah, there, you'd have three there in that case. And the, the common one, that's that generally is excluded from whatever usage is there, that'll be excluded from the usage of the overall building because it's just looking at the residential. So-called owner's meter, you know. Right, right. Yeah, okay, so exactly. That's if you have it, otherwise, yeah. Um, the renovations and additions, this is, uh, this program's great, uh, it does, yeah, we do require um, at least a 50% gun on the project, uh, along with substantial HVAC changes and a clear scope of work that's going to go, go uh, be happening. Um, the reason for that is that it's, it's based on savings. Uh, it's, how, it's how the rebates are, are tabulated, and I'll get into that here in a second. But So if you do a, a kitchen and bath only or something like that, it's not going to have the, it's not gonna hit the savings threshold that we need in order to generate these rebates. Um, so the same thing goes with uh, additions. We're not going to if you put a, you know, uh, finish off your screened in porch and put a heat source in it, that's not going to qualify. It needs to be like a 500 square foot or bigger, uh, something like an in-law apartment size. Um, with this program too, uh, it's, it's generally speaking, you're dealing with builders and homeowners, not as much developers. Uh, but uh, when I was doing the inspections, it was almost exclusively with homeowners. Um, and again, with the HERS, uh, this is a HERS rated, uh, HERS HERS Raider driven program, so you're gonna be using one of our HERS Raiders. Uh, what, one of the main differences between the low rise program and the renovations and additions program is this. Uh, this is an interest free loan that's available that I'm sure many of you have heard of from the, from the other Mass Save programs. Uh, but this is available in the uh, uh, RNA program. And it's seven years, $25,000 interest free. Um, or if it's a multifamily, it's seven years up to $50,000. And this is true interest free. It's not like they're piling on the cost and then calling it zero interest, but you paid it all up front. No, no, all this right. is because you're dealing with the, with the contractor and then you're dealing with the bank. Uh, so uh, every five grand looks like $68 a month. So it makes a big difference. It allows you to make that necessary upgrade that you really want to achieve that energy efficiency level that you want to. Um, Here's how the incentive structure is broken down in, in this program. Uh, this program uses performance-based uh, performance baselines, uh, which are essentially the lowest you can go, as the term you used, uh, one step below. Uh, illegal? Yeah, one step <laughs> above illegal. Um, so we are really trying to incentivize you to go above that in any way, shape, or form you can. Uh, the maximum incentive in these two programs is $10,000. 
Uh, the average incentive in the low rise program is about $1,500. The average incentive in the renovations and additions program is, is a bit more at $4,250. Uh, how these incentives are calculated, uh, we will, uh, take, again, it's all based on the savings. So 50 cents per kilowatt hour saved, $50 per MMBTU of fuel saved. And then we're gonna take that savings over our baseline. So say you uh, have 10% uh, savings over that baseline, we're then gonna multiply that by the 4,000 there and add an extra $400 on the rebate. Uh, so you just add those three up and that would be, end up being the particip participant's rebate. Uh, the multifamily one, pretty much exactly the same except for the savings is multiplied by 2,500. And this is per unit. So if you have a three unit, it would be times three of these for one for each unit. Um, one big thing here that we come across issues with is you cannot also receive the prescriptive mail-in rebates for, say, the heating system from the MassSave website. You can do uh, one of these programs or you can do the heating system. You can't do both. Uh, it's a great way to get a phone call from me. <laughs> um, so, of the 200, uh, sorry, 351 communities across the state of Massachusetts, 299 of them have adopted stretch code uh, at this point. Uh, stretch code requires performance path for compliance. So if you're going to have to use a HERS rater anyways, you might as well try and get some money back afterwards. Um, they do plans, that, plans analysis, diagnostic testing on these projects, and it really, really help drive deeper energy savings and improve occupant comfort down the road afterwards after the project's done. Um, so, where are we next? In this one? Yes, okay. Um, with the renovations and additions program, uh, the HERS readers are going to be doing a lot of diagnostic testing on the home. Ideally, we want to do the blower door and duct leakage tests before and after. Uh, a lot of times, when they come in half gutted, they didn't hear about the program or whatever. It's still a relatively new program. Uh, but in that case, the blower door can't be done at the beginning, but you can still do it at the end and capture those uh, savings, the infiltration savings. Uh, we'll also do infrared testing, ventilation commissioning, and quantify the savings that's, kind of, that's done by the project. Um, again, I, get, I use this term too, all the time, way too much, uh, but how much plan, plans analysis and using the HERS rate really does help create a lot more savings for the project. Even if it's not required by the town, I, I recommend it. Um, uh, they will do, they'll provide you technical guidance, expertise, and just create an overall plan uh, before the project starts and how to maximize the efficiency of the project here. And we're coming really late here. so. I want to kind of we'll skip over some of this here, but um, yeah, so how the, it, it's performance based, so we're going to use, take an entire home and model it, and then compare that home after the project's done to our baseline home, and the difference with the bare minimum low efficiencies that we can go in the program compared to the overall scope of work that's done, uh, the difference between those two generates that, those savings and generates that rebate as a result. And the HERS rater does all that for you. Uh, so again, there's baselines for existing buildings and poor conditioned floor area here. Um, That'll be about 5% to generate the rebate too. Do you hire the HERS rater to do the analysis first? So you hire that person regardless? Yes, ideally in the Whether or not space. you end up moving forward? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so here's just an example of some of those baselines that are just above illegal um, with R37 in the exterior walls, R37 in the attic's not bad, uh, but you can read these here, it's, it gives a, a nice, uh, and there's baselines for everything around the home that we use. So existing and then addition? Yes, yeah, so the addition's going to be more strict because that's new construction. Well, so, but attic is R37 yeah, I know. and R35. It, it was done based on average uh, of homes that were built in 2019 in Massachusetts that did not go through the program. And that was what we what was found, believe it or not. I don't, don't ask me, I think maybe the Mass Safe program's other program really helps out by blowing the attics at 75% off. Uh, that could be one of the things that helps out the existing homes. <laughs> that one got me too when that one came up. So we're gonna skip over that, that's just a visual here. This is a case study that's where they got 38% above the baseline, so I got an $8,000 rebate on them. Uh, not just because it's a big house either, that's, that shouldn't affect it. So that's just, again, some of the equipment that was used. We're running late on time here, so I want to move through some of this and get really to the all-electric incentive. This is my baby, this is my favorite one, and this is, this is great. Um, so this is new construction only, one to four unit buildings. I do have paperwork on this right there. Um, the building must meet level one or level two in order to qualify. There can be no fossil fuels in the home, not even an insert gas stove. 
Um, the project needs to be rolled in the design phase using one of the HERS raters and must achieve either this level of savings for level one and level two or the HERS index score of 45 or 35 for these. Um, so you can see everything else here, it's on that form right there if you want to really look harder at it. Um, and these are the, the, the incentive levels. You got level one for a single family, so it's 25,000, all the way down to a, for a, uh, 40,000 for a level four. So it's, again, you build two of these, you're getting $80,000 back. That's you know, paying for two thirds of one of the units that you just built. Uh, the incentives are, are, are achieved in, um, so you can't have, uh, in a four unit building, you can't have three of them qualify and one not. Uh, all four have to qualify in order to get that money and that incentive. Um, so uh, let's see. What else are we looking at here? So yeah, so I kind of ran through it to skip over a couple of things here around the lake. But the, uh, if you are interested in any of this, uh, you can take a picture of this or write some of this down or take my card and call me. That's an easier way to do it. Uh, it's always nicer to have a, have a voice answer. So. Yes, good question. Uh, so can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. So the incentives? Yes. Are these only paid to individuals? If a, if a if a developer creates these things, does the developer receive this money? Yes, it's whoever is paying the meters. If whoever's paying the meters. Whoever pays for the project or pay, owns the house to the property, that kind of stuff. So, so if it were a friendly B, whatever. 40, friendly 40B. Friendly 40B. Yeah. If it were the town creating yeah. this, yeah. the okay. town would receive that money? If it was senior housing. Yeah. That's a good yeah. question. That's what I'm asking. I yeah. think so. Yes, I think so. So it's not just a, it's not just to individuals. It could be to. I mean, companies do it. Yeah, I, I, I've done. I've seen checks go out to companies with the company name on. I don't see why it wouldn't okay. go to Does the this town of Yearfield. Does this work with ADUs? Hmm? Does this work with this accessory dwelling units as well? Your your especially your all electric thing with that. Um. Yes and no. Uh, it, <laughs> this wouldn't work, uh, but. Um, so you're talking about like like you have a house and you're building an additional like an in-law off the back of it or something? No, totally yeah, separate. some of them are freestanding though. So if it was freestanding all electric, would it yeah. qualify for this thing? Even I would say as long as it's on its own electric meter. Okay. The next question is earlier, uh, how long I think, do you I think to... if we can open the door at least so people know that it's oh, okay. transition okay. time oh, and maybe you want to buttonhole these folks and, and ask your questions. We just finish we've got to start in 10 minutes. Yeah. How long do you anticipate this type of funding to continue? Because I know some of the programs. Oh, it's going to be around for uh, well. foreseeable okay. future. It'll okay. be around as long as I have been in MassSafe program. I've been around since 2008, so okay. uh, it's not going anywhere. Thank you. I'm very